Hi, my name is John Inquist. I'm going to provide you with a brief uh, decision process and a guide for determining feasibility of PM technology for successful PM part production. PM enjoys a competitive advantage over other manufacturing technologies when the following conditions prevail. The shape capability of PM offers economic and or specific engineering advantages and when the properties are satisfactory or so unique other technologies are not acceptable options. Some of the questions that we ask when, when trying to make preliminary decisions on feasibility are can the shape be pressed or formed with existing technology? What properties and functional requirements of the component are required? Are there unique material properties requiring special centering methods or technologies? Is the part a net or near net shape component? If so, what secondary operations or post centering processes are required to satisfy part print requirements? Again, the first question is can the shape be pressed or formed with existing technologies? If the projected surface area of the part in the plan view is say 50 square inches and the powder that's being used requires 42 tons per square inch to achieve the desired density, a press with at least 2100 tons would be required. This is a little bit of a problem in that there are few if any presses in the 2100 ton range. So if we look at a PM part and we see the area in the plan view and let's take a look at a component this size. Let's say this is 20 square inches. And again, we use the same 42 tons per square inch powder compressibility to achieve density. That would require around 840 tons. This is a feasible range for a number of PM parts makers. And we start to get into a press size that the industry can manage. Another question that we ask is how many part levels are required? When we look at a PM part, we count the levels. In this example, you'll see one, two, three, four levels. That would be the lower punch group. Then we have one, two, three, four upper levels. So you can see that we require four upper punches, four lower punch groups, and a core rod and, the, and a die. So you're going to have to have a compacting press with eight level part capability at least. Most multi-action presses have at least two lower and two upper level capabilities. There are also presses with three and four upper and lower levels. This is an example of a component. We look at a lower punch level one, lower punch level two, upper punch and a die and a core rod to form the splined ID. This is an example of a compacting demonstration. You can see how the compacting press functions. Another question is how tall is the part? We look at part thickness or part height this way. So this would be the overall part height. Typically, a part taller than two and a half to three inches uh, would require presses with unique or what we call deep fill capability. If a component is particularly tall, we can braze or join two parts together. The next picture is a great example of components that have been brazed using the center brazing process. Another consideration is aspect ratio. When we look at a PM part, we look at this component, and this would be the direction of pressing this way. We see that we have a fairly low aspect ratio part. However, within that part, we see this low aspect ratio wall thickness. We need to pay attention to that aspect ratio when considering PM part design. One to one is a very good. A six to one is feasible. And greater than 12 to 1 can be very challenging. The next example, you'll see a picture of a PM component that has a 15 to 1 aspect ratio 
in the uh, flat section of, uh, of the component in the wall. In some instances, there's features that can't be pressed into the part. Grooves are a good example of features that typically are not pressed into the uh, component. Here you see this large ring and we're machining a groove uh, according to the drawing uh, in, the, in the component because that part cannot be pressed. These are examples of net formed grooves on a punch face and these can be compacted uh, into the PM part. The next question is what are the properties and the functional requirements of the component? Since PM can provide excellent properties in the right application, material selection and part processing are very important. The material standard, MPIF standard 35, provides a comprehensive structure for specifying a variety of material and process options. When looking at material options, there are a number of questions to consider. The material composition can affect dimensional stability, response to secondary processing such as heat treatment and machining. Strength requirements, wear and secondary operations also influence material selection. Some component specific questions such as will the part operate under a fluid pressure? Must it be leak tight? Parts that are used in pneumatic and hydraulic applications cannot leak. Must the part require protection from corrosion? If so, how severe? Will it be used in a, in a, uh, a marine environment? Or do we need simple ambient corrosion to protect it from room conditions? Will the part require machining? If so, which surfaces and what tolerances are required? Will a component require heat treatment? If so, what type? Can we use a center hardened material? Or do we need to use a quench and temper material? Is the component used in a high impact application? Where, where high impact loads uh, must be endured. Will it be used in a wear application? If so, what, what surfaces? And what is the nature of that wear? Is it a high contact stress application such as you might see in a heavily loaded gear? Uh, will the part be used in a magnetic application? Is it a soft magnetic application or a hard magnetic application? Will it be used in a thermally demanding application such as an exhaust system? Exhaust system components need very uh, good corrosion resistance. Strength is also a consideration at elevated temperatures. Will a component require deburring? If so, what type of deburring is appropriate? Can it be deburred in the green state prior to sintering? Or must it be t vibratory finished or tumbled? Uh, what kind of corner breaks and radii are required? Uh, what other deburring requirements might be important? Will the component be welded? Powder metal parts are porous. Parts that are filled with oils and fluids don't readily weld. Is there a region of the part that's critical to the performance? And again, uh, one of the questions we need to ask is packaging. Uh, will unique packaging requirements uh, apply? Must they be returnable packaging or can we bulk pack in uh, containers? Are there unique material properties requiring special centering methods or technologies? Plain iron materials and iron carbon steel alloys are readily centered at conventional temperatures in the 2050 to 2100 degree F range and atmospheres using nitrogen and hydrogen or endothermic gas. Highly alloyed materials such as stainless steel, tool steels are best centered at elevated temperatures in the 2350 degree F range or greater in pure hydrogen or vacuum atmospheres. Parts requiring low flatness, and we look at a part like this, this direction we may choose to center on special fixtures to keep this face flat and these surfaces very parallel. And again, is the part a net or near net shaped component? What secondary or post centering processes are required to satisfy part print requirements? In some cases, final part tolerances or geometry cannot be achieved without secondary machining. Although tool control dimensions with tolerances in the 1,000th, that's 0.025 millimeters, are held, part thickness or length and ID OD tolerances in this range generally require a secondary machining operation to achieve. 
It should be noted that as the part size increases, net part tolerances also increase. So a part this size versus a part this size require more tolerance. The larger parts require more tolerance this way than does a part this size. Grooves, threads, or undercuts most likely will require machining. ID and or OD tolerances that are very close will require machining by turning, honing, or grinding. They may also apply to part thickness and parallel requirements. Extensive secondary processing tends to drive part cost. Part design geometry and tolerancing should consider part function. Low tolerance features, not functionally important, can drive cost without adding value. When the shape capability of PM offers economic or specific engineering advantages and the properties are satisfactory or unique, PM is the cost effective solution. The information in this presentation provides part designers and end users with preliminary guidelines to determine PM part feasibility. It is important to provide as much detail and part function information as early as possible in the design cycle. Whether designing for PM or converting from competing technologies, detailed communication of design details assures a better outcome. It should be understood that your MPIF affiliated parts supplier will have more questions and answers regarding part feasibility. If in doubt, call an MPIF member part producer to get comprehensive answers to your design questions. Thank you.